Welcome to Green Drinks, everyone who's joining us. Uh, my name is Ginevra. I'm the program director here at Sustainable Woodstock. We were founded in 2009, and we're a nonprofit community and environmental action and education organization building on Woodstock's legacy as the birthplace of the modern conservation movement. I'm getting feedback again. I don't know who it's from. Maybe everyone mute themselves right now. <laughs> and then unmute yourself if you're when you're ready to talk, John, Don and Annie. Yeah, just in case. I don't know where it's coming from. Um, so you've come to one of our Green Drinks events. These are social events to connect people who have similar interests. We invite local nonprofits, businesses, and individuals to make short presentations that highlight local sustainability initiatives or sometimes more global ones, uh, as is the case here. We are doing Green Drinks virtually right now, but we'll have some in-person events coming up this summer. So do look out for that. Uh, our next Green Drinks, though, is going to be April 13th and will be titled, What is a Land Trust and What Can It Offer Me? So this is my brief plug for that event. Um, we'll be joined by Peg Marins, the Vice President of Conservation at the Upper Valley Land Trust for a wide ranging discussion about land conservation. So that will be April 13th um, and April is the month of Earth Day. So we've also got an Earth Day event coming up on the 22nd with Leah Pennyman, who's an author and activist. She'll be presenting Black Earth Wisdom. So April is going to be a very exciting month and I would love for you to join us. You can look at our website for those events. So for tonight, before we get started, I'm just going to run through the agenda and introduce Don and Annie. Right now you're being recorded. I'm going to double check it. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce you. This workshop is led by Don Jones and Annie Smith Jones, who are joining us tonight. Don and Annie live in Bridgewater on a former farm that they are working on bringing back to productive use. They moved here in 2020, and the Coelho family moved in with them in 2021, consisting of their daughter Lizzie, a uh, husband, Chef Bernardo, and four grandkids, age two to nine. Following positions with startup and large environmental consulting firms, Don and Annie decided to start their own small consulting business. That was 31 years ago, with most of their work in the mid-Atlantic area and South Carolina. They always wanted to give back and were fortunate to become involved with a nonprofit focusing on identifying, assessing, and cleaning up some of the world's most contaminated sites. They have been involved with lead poisoning projects in Mexico, Senegal, and Brazil, where contamination has resulted in deaths and developmental problems, particularly with children. This presentation will discuss some of their work in Senegal and Mexico, um, and they're glad to have this forum to spread awareness of the severity of polluted health impacts and provide some positive results as well. So thank you both so much for joining us, and um, I'll, I'll let you go ahead. All right, I'm ready to start. Does everything look all right? It, uh, we hear you well, and you'll want to go ahead and share your screen so we can see your, all right. your slideshow. Oh, oh, you can. Thank you for helping me along. Here, here you go, Annie. Thank you. So we'll just comment through and uh, this work it's really on lead, and uh, you'll you'll learn more than you probably wanted to know. And hopefully, I can get it to work. Yes, that looks good. So first off, I have to hide you guys because I can't see it. There we go. <laughs> All right, so this. Pure Earth, it used to be called the Blacksmith Institute, but they're in uh, New York. And it was found as a way to address some of the world's worst pollution problems. Uh, people were involved with water, rainforests, other things. And the guy who started this says, yeah, let's get into hazardous waste and problems like that. It's really a cooperative approach. We don't go into any place and tell folks what they need to do, how to clean stuff up, that we know what's good for them, they have to want to do it. And we'll get into that in a little bit. They have a technical advisory board of probably 30 or 40 people that expertise in different areas to advise. There are people in country all over the world. Um, and they now focus, they started out as a more 
anything, what can we get done? And now it's really just on lead and mercury. And because those are the two most prevalent pollution problems that are affecting literally 100 million people, especially children. Lead contamination we'll talk about. The mercury I have not really been involved in, but gold mining, artisanal gold mining, they use mercury in an open walk, basically, to extract gold from the tailings or ore. And obviously, that goes into the air, and it's a waste product, if what they can't save. And there's currently more mercury in the atmosphere and the oceans and our fish that is coming from artisanal gold mining than any other source in the world. Uh, Pure Earth also has probably the lar has the largest database by country and sites of the health of the planet. So there's risks that we talk about with Ebola. You can get all of this. I'll go through it quickly. But basically, pollution up towards 10 million people for this, but it literally is now 100 million children in particular, again, have been identified as having health impacts. Maybe you can't work, they can't do well at school. Um, deep, um, what else, Annie? Uh, just De developmental delays. They could have, they could even be uh, delayed so much that they're retarded. They, we have problems with the pregnant mothers uh, being, having too high lead levels. So then their um, unborn children also. I mean, it, it's really, uh, very problematic. And as you can see, most of this is occurring in the economically depressed part of the world, uh, in Africa and Southern Asia and parts of South America. This did, uh, I can't remember, you know, if the movie about uh, Accra and Ghana, the recycling center, um, I don't know if, remember if that was shown through sustainable or a different source, but it was. It was, yeah, the burden. Yeah, yeah. so Pure Earth worked there and with, it was a simple solution to um, all the burning that they were doing and to get the copper out of a wire. And there's a simple solution of stripping the plastic off so they don't have to burn it. Um, anyway, this was just how Pollution's not a very hot topic for people to want to say, oh, I'd like to help that out. And AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis get a lot more funding. But that's not what we're here. But there's the wire that gets taken care of without having to burn it. Sources of lead contamination. Leaded gasoline, believe it or not. Um, the last country to stop was last year, and I think it was uh, Myanmar stopped leaded gas. But leaded, gas, leaded fuel is still used in uh, boats, airplanes, lead smelters. The amount of lead that is used in the world is gone up and up amazing after all these thousands of years. Used lead acid batteries is literally an epidemic in those parts of the world where car batteries are taken apart in a backyard, the lead is heated, and because it's worth some money, a lead battery in a tropical environment typically will last about a year. And a lot of those countries have nowhere to properly recycle them. There are obviously are old contamination sites, lead paint, ceramic glazes, which we'll talk about in Mexico in particular, uh, and some other sources of lead. It leads to decreased uh, IQ, health problems, birth weight, kidney damage, and as we'll discuss, uh, death. Lead toxicity, I really want to just point out this uh, 10 micrograms per deciliter. Uh, that used to be in the U.S. what the standard was if if a child was above 10, like for school testing, they would have to go see a medical professional. It's now down to five, and it really needs to be zero. There's really zero 
level of lead that is acceptable, particularly in children. Lead contamination, the placenta, so the fetus is impacted in utero. But you can children you are not so the way that Go ahead, Don. Them so much. You're picking up for us, Don. You might want to turn your camera off for a bit. Well, you're having a little bit of audio trouble, Don. Yeah, and he's frozen. I would turn your video off, Don. As the blood level and us our internet connections unstable, like ooh. No, I don't know what to say. There you go. There you you go. Came Is that back. better? I turned your video off. Okay. So what we've learned having the grandchildren living with us is that children under the age of five typically put their hands in their mouth 30 times an hour, 36 times an hour. So if they're living in an environment where leaded soil is present or lead paint, it gets into their system very quickly. I'm not saying anything about Cheerios. They're fine. <laughs> so what do you do with lead contamination? You put it in a landfill, encapsulate it, put it under a roadway. I mean, it's, it doesn't go anywhere. It does not migrate. Uh, it can solidify it, but it can't be destroyed. So in Senegal, it's Charoy sur mer and it was a fishing village that's now really part of the greater urban area of Dakar. And as you'll see, it was, it was settled during a drought and they had uh, a guy was having folks do lead acid battery break the batteries down and to make fishing weights to get the lead and they had a pile of sludge that literally when you break a battery apart there's sludge at the bottom that they would just take out dig out with their hand and put it in a pile and there was a really large pile probably 10 meters high and 30 meters long was there price of lead went up worldwide and somebody came and said there's a lot of money to be made here and started paying people to sift the soil bag it so they could get the lead out we would do a lot of testing after 15 or 20 children died and their blood lead levels were if you remember that graphic five maybe 10 micrograms per deciliter. These kids were up to 600 micrograms per deciliter. 30% lead in the soil. It's all dirt. Everybody just walks around picking it up. Uh, interior dust on the windowsills, 2% lead. So it was decided to um, excavate it would be the best way. Initially, the government wanted to move everybody out. We had meeting after meeting which is they have the community has to decide that they want to deal deal with this and what to do about it. Their number one concern was they did not want to be relocated. So we did lots of detailed assessments, came up with a strategy to clean it up, got approvals most of the time. Sometimes you have to do work uh, to get through government red tape and ask for forgiveness after the fact. And there's been follow-up blood lead testing after the cleanup was done. And that's been very, very good. There was lead, to, uh, blood, we'll go back to that for a second. We did blood testing, lead testing in the blood for the children and for community residents in order to sort of see what their levels were like so that we had a, a pre-cleanup level, base level. And then we did several times thereafter um, in order to see what happened after the cleanup. And what you do see is that the levels started, and you'll see further in the program, but the levels really decreased significantly. Unfortunately for um, some people, uh, lead will often um, settle in their bones, the bone structure, and sort of uh, come back out. So for some of the older people, this was particularly true. We found this in Mexico as well. Um, that they tended to stay high, whereas the children over time, their blood love, lead levels dropped 
significantly. Anyway, continue on, Don. So uh, the community is located on the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, that little cleared area is where the smelter used to be. Uh, again, when they settled this area, there was nothing but a little fill like, uh, fishing village. Little close-ups, little time frame of events, so informal lead battery recycling in the area for 12 years. Um, and then it started to spread. The soil got transported by people walking through it. They started sifting it. Again, they would get paid about $100 US, which was a huge amount of money, to take soil back to their homes and sift it there and bag it. And of course, the children are with them. And it moved throughout. It literally was, and you'll you'll get a link for the movie that was made. Uh, it's called. It's a lead rush. It's as similar as a gold rush, but it was a lead rush. People were bagging it, burying it under their in their yards, putting it under their beds, anywhere they could do to save it, like an insurance policy that I've got this. It's worth money of this bag of soil. And literally, it was going all over the community. And lead is not something like if gasoline spills, you can smell it. You can't tell it's there. Traders came from India and started buying it up and getting the sifting done. And then 31 children uh, died within a month. And they had no idea what it was from. They thought it was malaria at first. Uh, but it wasn't. And the blood lead level, the blood lead samples went back to France because it was an old French colony. They had the capacity and the lead levels were just never seen anywhere else in the world. It was amazing. So the government initially moved some of the soil and uh, did the testing. Again, these children, 42 of them were at 45 micrograms per deciliter. They could not test the dead children because of. Um, religious tradition, so they tested the siblings of the children that died. This is a view of the community. Like I said, it got it got developed initially as a fishing village during a drought. Well, the drought ended, and this community is underwater three months of the year, one to three feet of water. There is a railroad track you see there. There was a fertilizer factory up the road. And probably five times a day, a train load of tanker trains of sulfuric acid went through the right the middle of their community and their market. Then the lead just got thrown. You know, they didn't know what to do with it. They, they, nobody would deal with it anymore. So it was just all over the, we'd find bags buried in people's yards, in old abandoned buildings, old workshops. Uh, this is the community. It's like floods. The railroad tracks there, there's no infrastructure as far as trash pickup or anything like that. Or sewer. No sewer. The goats are happy, but yeah. very sad. And this is a market. It's a pretty uh, well-known market in the area, uh, Charu Sumer, the Marche. Um, these are the areas that we had to dig up. Again, you can see it's all just sandy soil. And then we had to figure out how to time the cleanup. So it starts raining around July 1st, and then you can't do anything for months. So we had to time it and get all the approvals from the government uh, to do the work beforehand. It got delayed and delayed because we didn't have a place to take the dirt initially um and then it rained and i was just like i remember and we were and it was like it flooded right away and but it stopped raining and dried out thank goodness we were also fortunate that two of our children got to come over and do testing they're environmental they're hydrogeologists like their father and uh they got to come do testing oh, there's don jones so it's a, a little machine that measures all the heavy metals in the soil so we could do literally hundreds and hundreds of readings, shallow and at depth, and identify the areas, the hot spots that needed to get taken care of. Inside, had to have crews clean because, again, the dust was up to 2% lead. Uh, not an easy task. You have to wash it down, 
several times and try to vacuum it out. You can look at all those surfaces that had to be cleaned. Little storage yards. I found this, this is under the street, bags of lead that got buried by this house. Um, we then dug it up, put it in a big pile and hauled it away. Uh, and it went to a huge landfill that is visible from space, buried 20 some feet underneath trash. So it's, it's never gonna be accessible to humans again. And again, it doesn't leach, it doesn't move. It's the safest place to be. I wanted it to go under a highway. They built a brand new highway, um, but it didn't go that well. You can see these little areas. It's The lead is in the soil, but it's covered with trash. You have to get it cleaned up. We used all local labor. Everybody was happy to be working, even myself. <laughs> that is the father behind me who five of his 10 children died. Clean it up. The day Put, we got, the, the day we had them clean up, you can see they're wearing their hazmat uh, outfits. They were so excited to be able to put these outfits on. Um, of course, uh, I think the as the day wore on, I think maybe the booties wound up on their heads, you know what have you, and it became more of a joke. But um, all the little kids took would take the gloves, and make balloons, and yeah. <laughs> it's it's just the idea is to get rid of the toxic stuff as fast as possible mm -hmm. to uh, get rid of the exposure and then we brought in clean fill to cover it up and in this one yard then it got nice grass and it's a happy ending for that part of it and they have they went back there's going to be a link to a movie again this about 11 minute movie that got made about this uh, they went back a year or so ago and did testing of all the kids and the blood lead levels were way down. I mean, below 10, I think it was, it was great. Very happy to, it took eight different trips to get over there to get through all the approvals and get it done. Switching a little bit to Mexico, there's about 50 to 60,000 artisanal ceramicists who still use lead glaze. It's called Greta. And they use it because culturally it was thought to give shine to the pottery that was better than other sources of glaze. And also I remember taking a cooking class for Mole in Oaxaca and she was like in the, the pot, the ceramic pot, you go, oh, you got to really scrape hard, scrape it hard. And the lead comes out of the scraping. I didn't know it at the time. And it adds a bit of sweetness to the food. So the idea is we needed to find out how extensive this was and worked with the government, a, a ceramicist who came up with a lead-free glaze that um, we'd go into communities, clean them up, assess it. And if they switched to that glaze, the government would put in a communal gas-fired kiln and they could stop using their wood-fired kilns, which were, they give kind of an uneven product because they can't control the temperature as well. And the whole idea is not only getting rid of the lead, but also giving the, the, the artisans a, a better market to sell their product. So we went to various, lots of small towns all over Mexico, all the way from uh, Jalisco, all the way to Veracruz and testing and lead and blood lead testing and um, finding out what it was about. And at the cleanups, it's not rocket science. It's pretty easy. This is a typical wood-fired kiln. And this will be in their home next to their kitchen sleeping area. And so the dirt floors, the lead could be pretty high. Uh, this is actually a lead-free glaze. So it it can be it look just as good as the leaded glaze. That's the Greta, which is the leaded glaze that they use when they're firing. Tight spots, lots of surface areas. But again, a power vac, clean it up, wash it down. 
in this spot, this is right next to their kitchen and sleeping area and cleaned it up and then put down a cement uh, concrete pad over it all to eliminate the exposure to the kids. Blood lead testing of the children in particular. And there's a nice gas kiln that this community got. Um, this was way up in the mountains. And I show this because we're working with, uh, well, I can't point them out, but there's Annie on the on the left, and next to her is the the government, the Mex the ceramicist who came up with the lead free glaze, who started this whole project. And further to the right is Jack Carabanos, uh, who is a lead expert in New York, uh, teaches at Hunter College. But you can see in that picture the two women that are foreground. Both of the two were pregnant, and we found when we were up there and when we were testing that they were testing so high that we recommended that they had to go into a hospital for um, removal, therapy. yeah, collation therapy in order to try to remove some of the lead from from their bodies uh, because their unborn child, you know, children were uh, being impacted. It's just very sad. Look at the woman in blue. She has a, you can't really tell, but that right down around her belly, it's a um, safety pin. Yeah. And culturally, a pregnant woman will put the safety pin over her fetus as a protection. And it was so sad because we knew that the lead had, is going to the embryo. Yeah. This is something I have. There were two brothers we worked with who used lead glaze. And one of the side effects of lead is, is they shake a lot. And so all they could make was pottery, very simple, plain, that they sold at Walmart and Costco. And once they stopped using lead and stopped shaking, they turned into real artisans. And this piece of work, they made, they could make such a better living making art versus just everyday pottery. So that's one of the good, good outcomes of it. And it is a beautiful piece. Anyway, you'll get these links to a nine minute movie about Senegal and uh, some of the other videos at pureearth.org. They're all, it's all available. There's tons of resources uh, there about it. And we were fortunate to be able to do it. Absolutely. We had a guy, a, a paint a contractor when we lived in Annapolis in an old, you know, historic house. And we needed him to, wanted him to do some work and he sh his shaking was so bad from all the lead paint removal he had done through his life that he couldn't paint because of his shaky hands so that was sort of a first realization that's it for that thank you <clears throat> excuse me thanks so much don and i'm gonna go ahead and ask you to start your video and you can see if you start it, if it will be glitchy still or if it'll work. And otherwise we'll just look at Annie, I guess. I have to go find it. You have to go find it? Okay. Yeah, you. we can see you now. It looks okay. Um, yeah, thank you for that presentation. Um, oh. All right, let's see. Oh, you're gonna do your video? Yeah, see if we can get it. Um, and in the meantime, I'll tell people to put your questions in the chat um, for Don and Annie. You can't, you can't see it. No, because you're sharing um, the PowerPoint screen. You need it. You could try share. You could stop sharing and share your whole screen. And we can probably see it or mm. stop sharing and share the YouTube. But if not, it's okay. Yeah, I'll lose you. <laughs> That's fine. Um, I'll send it out to everyone who's registered. So okay. that'd be better anyway, because they can you suggest know. you. Yeah, suggest everyone take a look if you're interested. They do have, uh, and we'll tell you when you get the link, 
from what point in the video, if you're really only wanting to take a look sort of at the Senegal piece and what we did, um, they have a, I don't know, it's a couple minute uh, presentation specifically on that. And it, it really sort of brings home some of the ideas of how devastating that contamination was to the community with the numbers of children that died and, and what had happened. It brings home the idea that the community really can work together in union with uh, Pure Earth, which is who we represented, in trying to clean up the situation. Um, and that it shows very clearly that once it was cleaned up, that in just a matter of time, the blood lead levels really decreased um, in the children and, you know, sort of a very nice, happy ending, if you will. So um, what's Kathy saying? <laughs> One of the reasons we moved to Woodstock is Kathy and Rick Fred Fisk, we've known for 45 years, and there they convinced us to move up here. That's right. <laughs> well, Kathy has a totally new appreciation for your work. <laughs> Kudos, that's sweet. Um, oh, that's sweet. <laughs> There's a question that was sent directly to me, so you can't see it, but um, I'll ask it of you. Um, this person's curious, why was respiratory protection worn in Mexico, but not in Senegal, at least from the photos? No, it, it was really, it was utilized in both places. You're, you are right. Some of the pictures that you see in Senegal, um, Don was out, you saw him using the XRF out in the field, that kind of thing. But when he's doing, for example, the XRF, it the contamination, his his ability to really get uh, inhale that is minimal. Yeah, uh, partly it's I was outside. Yeah, and but the inside when we're in a workshop and it's the dust really yeah moves around a lot when we're trying to clean it up. So that made sense. But outside um, we weren't creating really any dust. So if you picked up that impression, that really wasn't the case. Uh, uh, protective uh, hazmat suits were used. Certainly when we were working, we were moving soil around these bags that had to sort of get dug up um, in a variety of places and so forth. Particularly when we had it, there was it, it, it would come to a central area and we would have huge piles of this and then we would then have to move it out of uh, the town uh, in big dump trucks and always there was protective uh, gear used at those you know those times i think that the question that the follow-up was those guys are working outside uh, not in a confining kind of space with dust and they were probably given mass, but the kids just would come and take anything they could find as it was a novelty. You just got to work with what you can work with um, and get it out of there as fast as you can. It's an incomplete answer, but. You know, in these countries, unlike the United States, where there are standards for everything one has to do and clean up and and you know levels and so forth these countries have no standards whatsoever so you know to come in and to identify assess and identify the extent of a problem and sort of map out how you're going to systematically remove the soil and get it out of there um you know we use the best practices that we have from the united states um, but sometimes some of those practices were not practical in some of these countries. Um, so you, you come in with that knowledge and you really try your best uh, to use appropriate safety protocols, et cetera. Um, but sometimes in some of the countries, it doesn't work and you've got a job to do and um, you know the dangers and you really work as best as you can given your circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> it was very green grass too. The goats <laughs> loved it, let me tell you. 
Yeah, the quality of the green grass, grass in the rescued spot. Um, my- so a, go- a goat is a, basically, it's an insurance policy yeah. uh, for these families as not only a source for milk and eventually meat, but if really gets bad, hard times, um, they can sell the goat. Mm-hmm. And it, it makes a big difference. Um, Michael, I know you've hopped on as well. I'll ask the next question and then sure. you can do another. But um, Brenda asked, what projects are you working on now? Ah, that's a good question. At current moment, we're, we don't have a project. Uh, I'm always hopeful that we will get assigned a new one. Um, there's been some discussion that we may go and help one of the things that uh, Pure Earth does is an assessment, I think we mentioned it briefly, all over the world of some of the worst uh, lead and mercury contamination uh, locations. And they're doing a huge database really to sort of pinpoint and take a look at this. Um, by collecting that data, then they can start to formulate a plan as to how they're going to uh, attack this, how they're going to generate and work on trying to get money from, um, you know, green or uh, not Red Cross, Green Cross, Green Cross, and some other places. World Bank, there's lots of funding money, sources. You know, this kind of thing, but come up with projects. Anyway, there was some discussion that we might uh, help with some of the identification in some of these um, uh, countries. But as of the moment, we do not have a current uh, project. I I think uh, there wasn't anything going on during COVID. Uh, And they've also beefed up a lot of their country representatives and they're well-trained. And that's, that's the idea. Like local people take it over and do it themselves. Right. Um, and uh, the focus on lead and mercury, that's taken, you know, they're spending a couple of years logistically transforming from what they were before and and setting that up. Mm-hmm. Oh, I have a, actually a couple of questions that I posed happen to be in line here. Um, so they're interrelated. What, what inspired you to undertake such challenging projects? And was there some other project that you had learned about that really made you aware that you could accomplish what you were, or you hope to accomplish what you were in the kinds of situations and circumstances you were working with? I um, just always felt that call to do something different. Having the business is one thing. Um, do a lot of cleanup of gas station, petroleum, uh, dry cleaner kind of stuff, but always me personally, it was uh, trying to get somewhere else and have an impact. And we could do pro bono work, that was fine. And I I think what happened is the founder of Pure Earth, Richard Fuller, had some notice, it probably was before email even, I don't know, uh, to a groundwater group National Groundwater Association, asking if anybody was interested in help. So I responded, said, sure. And I went to New York and met him. And um, this project came along and was very, at the beginning, not knowing what the extent of the contamination was in Senegal. And so somebody thought, well, it's X amount of dirt. And I thought, well, that's just like 10 truckloads or something. That's easy. So, well, fine, you go do it. So. <laughs> And that's how it really, and I'd never, it was, it was a awesome experience. It's also a scary, you know, you know, making that, give them, that give, jump. Give them yeah. the story. The very first time you yeah, I landed a guy who was supposed to be with me, who was, was a real expert in this, had done a ton of work all over the world and his plane got delayed. So I, I landed the car three in the morning. Uh, there's not a lot of street lights. I'm surrounded by a hundred of my new best friends who want to take care of me. I decide I need a little money. So I go into this little, it's the airport was not anything great. Uh, I go to the ATM. I put my card in and it keeps it. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, well, whatever. And then this, I get dragged to a taxi and thrown in. And I am thought, well, if this is it, it's it, whatever. <laughs> and, Next morning, I wake up and I go back to the airport on a Sunday and knock on the door by the 
machine and this woman answers and there literally is a box with full of ATM cards. And I said, oh, I lost you. She reaches down and is this it? Yep. God, see you later. And then I found the ATM that always worked. And I only went to that one. But one trip turned into many. And I was thankful my daughter, uh, our daughter, who had spent time in South America, just on her own, went to Honduras and to Mexico. And I was like oh, in my room looking out in the city. And it's, it's it was a pretty poor city. She said, Dad, just get outside. Go get out there. Nope. So you just do. And everybody was absolutely wonderful. Yeah. Wow. That's great. The, absolutely the, wonderful. In the community, I mean, we would stay at lunchtime. They would take a break from working, you know, um, about 12 o'clock or so. And they would, everybody would go back to their homes and they would have uh, their family meal. And, you know, then they would reconvene a little bit later in the afternoon to start back up again. And we always went to, were invited to a particular family. And it was the family actually that lost the, um, I don't know, five kids, three, you know, five. You know, they five. Lost five. Lost I'm stopping John's video again. You're, you're both um, glitching. Uh, very, very interesting family. Um, oh, yeah, it says internet is, uh, connection is unstable. Sorry about that, guys. You know, that's Bridgewater Internet, I guess, that kind of thing. But yes. it just, it was very fascinating. It was very fascinating to sit with her and later at least one day. And so she did some recount. Uh, 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 talking to us about what the situation was like uh, with her children and, and so forth. And, you know, it was very sad, but she was also very happy to see that something was being done to clean this up. Um, thank you. I turned off your video and Don's disappeared, but you're still here. So I, he'll probably come back. Well, he's down there. He's leaning against the tree. That's uh, Kilimanjaro down one year decided he wanted to climb Kilimanjaro. So that's his picture. Oh, there he is. I do see it now. Um, here, I'll let him unmute himself. Um, thank you. Was there, sorry, Michael, was there more of that question? No, that's good. Thank you. Um, I put a question here that I was wondering related to the film we showed about, you know, American waste making it to other countries. And I was curious where the lead acid batteries came from that caused all the lead contamination. And if that was like a case of other countries polluting, um, feedback polluting or how often you see like our waste making it to other countries. So in the US, um, am I coming through all right? Yeah, you're fine. In the US batteries, uh, you know, we pay a fee when you buy get a battery for your vehicle and that goes back to there are recycling centers it's cradle to grave in the Western world. It's not so in the other parts of the world. These batteries are coming from all the cars, buses, uh, anything with lead batteries. Um, so now we're transitioning, presumably, into lithium batteries. Um, and that's better from an environmental standpoint. Lithium is, I'm not aware that it's really toxic. The bad part of lithium is that it still uses child labor to mine the metal as they do with lead. Mm. Um, but this is it's an epidemic and batteries just don't last more than about a year in these tropical environments. And you, you can understand how many more vehicles there are than there were 20 years ago in China and in India and in um, <clears throat> Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa. And Don, I also do think, though, a certain early on, a certain amount of the batteries that they were over taking apart and smelting the lead down uh, earlier on, I do think there are some, certainly some U.S. batteries that made their way over there. Um, I think we as a, 
a group of people need to when when we think we're sometimes recycling properly today it might, is probably better but when we were thinking we were recycling in the past some of the times that wound up not necessarily being recycled, shipped out of the United States elsewhere. And First, uh, you know, the previous when uh, the question about why do this, one of the when I've heard about these guys that first time, I heard one of the projects they were working on way back early on was in China, and it turned out I mean like ninety percent of our recycle electronics was going to this one village in China. And it was absolutely devastating. And care, you know, you have to be careful. There was a company in Colorado. Yes, we recycle your electronics. And all that stuff was found on a container ship heading to Africa. So I know when we recycled, this is 20 years ago, we found out who they were, asked all the right questions. What do you do with this stuff? Um, because it's full of heavy metals. Thank you. Yeah, I was curious about that. Yeah, um, and the, and the, I don't know much. Like I said, the mercury side is different, but but their whole focus on the mercury side is gold again, and they've they're with a lot of jewelers. Uh, finding out where does your gold come from, and really finding out what the source of that is from a child labor standpoint, and from not using mercury and it's the same with lead acid batteries there is a lot of funding and all of the battery manufacturers have now created a consortium to go and address this and build recycling centers throughout the world so that's good news i think one of the things that they're trying to do i had heard over in some of the countries is sort of this idea of an exchange if you want to buy a battery, you have to give them a battery. Um, and the idea being that then they had control on where did that battery go to instead of it just going, you know. It's going to evolve into the same as hazardous waste in the U.S. It'll evolve into a cradle to grave system mm -hmm. that can track, track where they're going. But, you know, they're in Senegal, there were about 10 or so women doing this, and they're getting paid very well at the time. And so when we got the cleanup going and they're not doing it anymore, yeah, uh, it's, well, that was a good job. Is there any alternative to that? Yeah. And there were discussions back and forth about that. You know, our expertise is identifying and cleaning it up. Our expertise is not in coming up with an alternative economy or support system. We, Our job is to remove the risk that was killing children. Um, so, and, and I think that that's not an unreasonable, that's what our expertise is. It's not in how to set something else up. Yeah, but the community itself, I think, you know, started to raise that issue. If you yeah. take this away from us, what are we going to do? Uh, this particular fishing village um, really no longer did a whole lot of fishing. Uh, the waters were too polluted, et cetera. So they needed some sort of um, income. Uh, you saw in some of the pictures really how poor they are. So we're not talking a, a real high level of income. We're just talking, you know, bare necessities in order to, you know, have food to give to the children or, you know, what have you. Um, so some of the people in the community were raising that question as to, okay, we take this away, what can they do in return? And as Don said, that wasn't our expertise, but the community was looking, what could they do internally within themselves to sort of solve uh, some of this particular problem? goes back and it's been demonstrated over and over and over that we were there to do what the community wanted to get done. They had to want to do that. Mm -hmm. I keep my personal side is there's 20,000 aid organizations in Haiti and it's still the poorest country in this hemisphere. 
something is very wrong with whatever is being done. And the job that Purit did in Haiti was, again, it was a lead thing. Got the soil cleaned up, turned it into a park, soccer field, playground. Um, the one in the Dominican Republic, actually, they got uh, um, Poppy. Poppy went down to say, yay, uh, when that project was done, David Ortiz. Mm. So that's a good thing. It's good stuff. Um, anyway. Another question I had, um, are there organizations that are doing the, this kind of effective environmental cleanup in similar communities that you would recommend people look into possibly supporting? I would I would recommend you support ours, Pure Earth. Um, I don't think there, there may be other small, that bothered me when we were there. You, you could be, because Dakar, you know, there's a lot of people there uh population wise and there's a lot of ngo kind of work going on and i always thought could there somehow be a clearinghouse to coordinate those that work because there's private companies private environmental companies that are getting paid to do work in senegal for cleaning up contaminated sites it's just this one came through world health organization said we just yeah. we need help we don't know what to do and there's not the resources. The town of Charoy Sumer is one of five communities, population of about 35,000 people. And their annual government budget is 200,000 US. Wow. So not a lot of services. Yeah. Particularly those services that would impact health. Sewer, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, no sewer. No water. Yeah, I didn't. There, there was a picture and I, I didn't notice if it showed up, but I noticed when we were walking th through the village in the first time in the community that the window sills were down near the street level. And it was because of the flooding, the, the, uh, the government kept putting in, bringing in sand and filling it up. So the windows were almost, the bottom of the windows was almost at street level because it used to be probably eight feet, six feet lower. Wow. But anyway, it's when I started as a geologist in this business, everybody I knew went to work in the oil patch. And I went to the pollution path. People thought we were crazy. Yeah. Well, it's really fascinating to hear about. It's not something I think a lot of us see on like a daily basis. So no, it's you know, it's really sad. Really, it's it's devastating if, if if a child grows up uh, developmentally disabled because of lead contamination or mercury. Um, again, they can't do well in school. They're not going to get a good job. Uh, other people can't work. It has a tremendous ripple effect through an economy. It certainly keeps them in poverty. When you, you know when you think when you think about that, how do you get ahead? You you educate yourself and you try to make something you know sort of better of yourself, what have you, and you know that's not happening when you have communities that are as polluted as this particular community was. Um, but you know, I suppose the good news is, at least for us, the good news is that you know there is something that can be done about it if people care enough or if people get involved or, or you know, what have you. Um, you know, the way we got involved was obviously, you know, we felt compelled to go out and, and provide some expertise to a community who then took on the project with us uh, and worked side by side with us, you can see, um, and, you know, something happened and the end result uh clearly five years later and we went back we tested and we we took our xrf back and we um examined you know some of the streets and the small alleyways and inside homes etc to sort of see what the lead levels were and many of those lead levels were had dropped significantly obviously we had moved a lot of the lead out but you know you it's in the soil. You can't get all the soil out. So you do the very best you can. But it did show up in the lead testing 
uh, in the children and the, the moms and dads, et cetera, that that had decreased significantly back down to what would be considered at least by U.S. standards um, acceptable. Intervention uh, through WHO and the community work to the community's advantage, obviously. It would have been much easier for the Senegalese government to come in with bulldozers, yes. kick every, just flatten the whole village and say it, it's done, nobody go there anymore. Yeah. But this was their home and they did not want to be Lucy. kicked out of their home. Uh, protection again. Um, yeah, can I read the question? So it's in the, yeah, oh, I'm sorry. In the video record. Um, did you ever at any time think you needed protection for yourselves from these toxins or anything else? If so, what did you use? Because you, in lead in particular, you don't know if it's certainly initially, if it's there or not. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say that the clothing we took and shoes, everything was discarded before we left the country. Uh, didn't want to bring any lead back. If, if And it would have been minuscule. Uh, again, the exposure route versus stepping in, um, you know, a pile of pool of gasoline is very different exposure. From lead I, ingested. Yeah. And we weren't doing that. Yeah, I also th seem to recall, I don't know, Don, if you remember, but I think at one point we did ourselves what our blood le lead levels were to before. See if, before and then after um, to see if we ourselves had picked up um, levels. But, you know, our, um, our length of time of the contamination, duration, and the intensity of it was nothing like what the villagers would have gotten. So um, yes, we could have, um, we did protect ourselves as well. We did do uh, lead testing on ourselves. Um, we were pretty comfortable with, you know, certainly what we were doing. Uh, again, you can't see it, you can't smell it, you don't, but you know it's there. So, you know, we would do and take protection as we, you know, Ken, I think if you were to flip back on some of the photos that you saw of Don, you saw very little of me, but, you know, we were always uh, wearing gloves. We were always, you know, this kind of thing. So, um, um, you know, lead is just insidious. So I grew up in LA. <laughs> um, so I, growing up, I was equivalent to smoking two packs a day because of the smog. But what's more fascinating is today, you go to LA, Detroit, Chicago, any industrial city, the lead is still in the soil from when we used leaded gas. It, mm -hmm. it cannot be destroyed. And part of the lead in Flint was in the summertime, the blood lead levels go up in children in these cities because they're outside after a winter of being inside and they're playing in the dirt again. And the dirt has lead in it. We think we'd have learned from uh, was it Captain Cook, I think that they all had mental mental issues after eating, you know, salt water got into the lead solder and the tins of the food they ate and created uh, problems, lead poisoning. Yeah, it's a good point that we're not immune from lead here either. No, um, no. <laughs> old pipes. Yeah, yeah, it's lots of old pipes and other things. Um, we're just past six thirty, so I want to not have us run over. And thank you for your time uh, for spending an hour with us and kind of going through the work you've done. Uh, we really appreciate it, and thank you to everyone who came. I'm gonna, I'll send out that recording. Um, and make sure you both get it and I'll send the video as well and any other information that you want me to to send along I'm happy to well uh, maybe I can I give a little plug maybe you can give the information to pure on pure earth go to the website explore it whatever uh if you feel so inclined they're absolutely a wonderful nonprofit um that is doing some really good things in the world
Well, thank you, Don and Andy. It's just incredibly impactful work and really inspiring. Thank you for having us. Certain places too. Yeah. I think I had my um I don't know what year anniversary, but they they persuaded me to go over to Senegal taking an XRF over uh in order to meet up with my husband. And don't worry, you can have your your 40th or whatever anniversary it was, which we had in Dakar, um doing this work. It's <laughs> <laughs> great. Anyway. I right. well, appreciate always like the chance to spread spread the news. Indeed. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Have a good night. You too. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.